are privileged this evening to have our missionary, uh, Brother John LaBelle, with us from Africa. So, Brother, if you go ahead and come and preach God's word. And uh, we are so excited to have you guys this evening. Okay, let's, let's see. I think you're going to do great. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it was okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Yeah, it's it's so funny. I'll every I mean, we preached in probably 285 churches around the world, and and every church is not either like they don't say anything at all. It's like dead silence, or they're like, yeah, you know. I prefer the yeah kind of churches. Amen. So praise the Lord. Good to see you all. So if you open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Um, we got a lot to get through tonight. Um, I noticed that nobody is sitting in a window, so if you do fall asleep and fall, you're not going to fall that far. So praise the Lord for that. If you, it's in Romans chapter 10. We'll start reading in verse 13. I love that sound. The sound of Bible pages turning. The most beautiful sound. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you and praise you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for this church, Lord, this lighthouse for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for their faithfulness and their service, Lord. Thank you for everyone who came tonight. Father, we know that there are many who aren't here because of the youth camp, and we do lift that work up to you. Father, I ask you please to bless all of the preaching, the teaching, the fellowship, all of it that would have a major impact on the lives of those youth that are there, Father. That you just win some to uh, glory, Father, through faith in Jesus Christ, and move some to surrender to give their lives to serve you as well. But Father, for the, everyone here, I ask you, please, Lord, that not one person would leave here unchanged. That each and every one would be burdened more for souls, more for the mission field, Father, and that and each one would be uh, drawn closer into the image of Jesus Christ through your word. And Father, I ask for myself, please, that you fill me with your spirit, direct my heart, my words, my thoughts. Help me bring glory and honor to your holy and precious name with everything I say. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're the LaBelle family, uh, missionaries to Sierra Leone, West Africa. Uh, we're sent out of Eastside Baptist Church in Greenville, Tennessee, through Beacon International Baptist Mission. Although we are out of Tennessee, uh, actually the North Pacific Northwest is uh, what we call home. Uh, all four of my children were born in Oregon. Uh, we moved from down south. Uh, in 1995, right after we got married, and by down south, unfortunately, I mean California. And so we moved up to Portland, Oregon in 1995, and I uh, said all my ch children were born up there. This is, uh, my name's John, this is my wife Kelly. So uh, we have been friends since we were 13 years old, uh, and we've been married now 28 years, and she still likes me. Praise God. So I can't even tell you. If you even hear like even a third of some of the stories I have to share with you and the fact that she still likes me, she's a special woman. So praise God for that. So we have four children, as I said. Uh, they grew up partially on the mission field. Uh, my oldest daughter, Gabrielle, is 25. She's a senior at West Coast Baptist College studying missions. She just got married a little over a month ago uh, to a, another student at West Coast. They're praying about the Lord's will for missions. My daughter, Cammie, is 23. She's also a senior at West Coast studying missions. Um, and so there is a young man who's trying to become uh, her husband, but I'm going to make him pay for it. So... <clears throat> And uh, uh, my third daughter, Madeline, is 21 years old. She married a year ago to a young man, uh, Joshua Marsh, who uh, actually grew, was born in the Congo in Africa, uh, lived as a missionary child in Africa, Congo and South Africa, until the age of 24. And he had never lived in the United States before following my daughter to Bible college. So you see the power of a woman. Praise God. So um, they have actually surrendered to come and serve alongside of us in Sierra Leone. They've got some education to finish and, of course, deputation. And then my son Gregory is 18 years old. He's on a Jewish outreach, outreach ministry in New Jersey right now, doing 40 hours a week, door-to-door -door evangelism, trying to win Jews to the Lord. And that is actually helping him raise money for Bible college. He will start as a freshman this coming August. He believes missions, but he's going to do an evangelism major. So... 
So I said, so we're, we're, this is kind of our home territory. Uh, I've lived in California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska. I've lived up and down the coast. Uh, prior to surrendering as a, a missionary, I owned a construction company and a home inspection business. And a missionary came through our church now 13 years ago, I believe. Yeah, 13 years ago. And he shared his ministry to Sierra Leone. And he just challenged us. And we just felt the Lord's burden us. And we just couldn't get rid of the burden. And so I'm hoping to do something... Uh, the uh, similar for you guys tonight. So we're going to look at the Word of God. We're going to, I'm going to try to get into a message, but I want to tell you about Sierra Leone first. So Sierra Leone is on the west coast of Africa. It's right on the tip of the bulge of Africa. It's a small country about the size of South Carolina, uh, although there are about 8.5 million people in the country. It's a former British colony, so it's an English-speaking country. I thank God for that. I'm now 52 years old. I don't have to learn another language to be able to preach and teach and help people know, know Christ as Savior. However, there are 16 tribal languages as well. So the people that we deal with um, speak English, Mendi, Sherbro, and Creo. Um, and so we have men that we work with who speak all of those languages. And so they can either preach, teach, or interpret so that we can better reach the, the, those people. So um, the, the country itself is made up of roughly 85% Muslims and about 10% Christian is what they say, but that's Catholic. Um, the actual estimated number of born-again believers is less than 1% in the country currently. And so they, they pride themselves on religious tolerance. So interestingly enough, the current president of Sierra Leone, Matabayo, is from my village, the one I'll be telling you about tonight, um, and he's, he would call himself a Christian. And so because he's a Christian, the vice president has to be Muslim and vice versa. So if the, the president was a Muslim, they would have to have a vice president who was a Christian. Um, they pride themselves on religious tolerance, which actually really helps us in sharing the gospel and spreading the word, as you'll hear. So when we went on our deputation, uh, traveled, let's say, 120,000 miles around the United States, preached in over 250 churches, and um, you know, told everybody about Sierra Leone, nobody ever heard of the country. I'd always say, how many people have ever heard of Sierra Leone? And like literally in the biggest church we went to, there's five people. Well, then right as we finished with our deputation um, and we announced our departure date, I bought plane tickets to go over and get a house secure for us and all of this. J two weeks later, uh, we, uh, Ebola broke out in Sierra Leone. You guys remember Ebola back in 2014? It was like the precursor to the COVID pandemic. The whole world freaked out. And then we went from nobody ever hearing for, about Sierra Leone to everybody knowing about Sierra Leone, and they were all afraid. It was kind of an interesting time. And so the country was effectively closed for two years. Very, very challenging time for us. I mean, you can imagine you, we got rid of our business, our home, our three dogs and two cats and 25 chickens and leave all our friends and family and, and go over and try to go over this country that the Lord's burdened us for just to have the door closed right as we were ready to go. So we, after a lot of praying and really, truly miraculous circumstances, the Lord allowed our family to go to South Africa um, as missionaries. We served uh, just outside of, in a township just outside of Johannesburg, South Africa. We were there for five and a half years. Um, the Lord is very, very gracious. To, uh, he knew exactly what we needed. The ministry there was phenomenal. The family life there was just exactly what we needed. In fact, the young man that my daughter ended up marrying, uh, Joshua Marsh, they ended up living five doors down from us. Um, and so we were able to meet them there, even though they're American missionaries. And so the Lord kind of just worked it out perfectly. So we planted Solid Rock Baptist Church in South Africa, and we, did, we just had a fantastic time. My children learned church planting. They learned how to prepare Sunday school lessons and how to start Sunday schools and how to plant churches and, and do evangelism. We taught them how to soul win. Uh, in fact, every Thursday we would go to, um, uh, there's three train stations in, in our township of 750,000 people, and we gave out over 100,000 gospel tracts um, and just had, saw a lot of people get saved. Um, I got to work in the prison system there in South Africa. I love prison ministry. Our prison had 16,000 prisoners. And so then my section had 5,000 men. Once you went through the third security gate, they'd open up the door and they'd let you just walk in. No doors on any, you know, nothing locked up, nothing closed, no guards at all. They would just let you walk right in. I can't tell you how many people said to me during that five years that God sent them to prison so that they could get saved. 
to just praise God for the way he opened doors. <clears throat> I saw you guys are having a VBS program. We love VBS programs, just absolutely love them. Uh, actually, in, in South Africa, uh, with uh, uh, South Africa, an evangelist and his family, our family would help them put on th four to five different VBS programs all around South Africa every year. So a lot of kids get saved, just phenomenal ministry opportunities. Uh, we did it uh, uh, the first time at our church plant. And it was really funny because by faith, I prayed that God would send us 50 kids. Okay? We were a small church plant, you know, and just, oh, God, would you please get 50 kids? And so we bought all of the, the food and all of that. And that first day, we had 168 kids show up. So the week's worth of food went into that first day. And then after a long day, we went and stopped and bought a bunch more groceries. So, so by God's grace, we saw 64 kids publicly accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Just that one VBS alone. So the ministry there was just fantastic. It was healing for our family, uh, although it was kind of funny because people were afraid of Sierra Leone. And when we changed to South Africa, so many people would comment and talk to us and say, we're really thankful because, you know, Sierra Leone was so dangerous. And we would just chuckle because what they didn't realize is, I don't know what it is today, but five years ago, if you Googled what are the 10 most dangerous cities in the world, five of them are in South Africa. And number three was where we lived. So it was far more dangerous than Sierra Leone. I mean, when I said we'd go to the train stations and give out tracks, every single week at least one person would come up to us and say, you shouldn't be here. It's not safe for you and your family. Someone's going to get hurt. We had 11 break-ins in five and a half years. And when I say that, you have to understand, break-ins or attempted break-ins. It's not just like your home where you think of, oh, they got in. We had a six-foot-high concrete wall topped with three feet of electrified fencing. If you touch this fencing, you're knocked to your knees, an alarm would go off, and ADT security would be called, and they would be there in minutes in full riot gear with machine guns. Inside that fence, we had two guard dogs, a German Shepherd and a Chow Chow. The Chow Chow's name was Snuggles, and he would eat you. I am not kidding, okay? So we had those two guard dogs, and then we had burglar bars in every single one of the openings of our home. In fact, at night, we would lock ourselves behind three different security gates. The last one was in the hallway, separating the bedrooms from the living area. And in the living area, we had motion sensing security system that also called ADT that. And we still had 11 break-ins or attempted break-ins. It was just crazy. But see, the Lord gives you grace. If you're in the Lord's will, you're very safe. I was just talking to somebody. They say, if, if you're in the Lord's will, I think it was Stonewall Jackson said, you're as safe in the battlefield as you are at home in bed if you're in the Lord's will. So we just kept serving the Lord, and we were very, very blessed to see a, 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 lot, a lot of fruit from our labors. And so I believe that the reason that all four of my children are today desiring to serve as missionaries and serve the Lord is because of the life that we enjoyed there in South Africa, serving the Lord together as a family. So the problem was, is that the entire time I'm serving in South Africa, my heart was clearly somewhere else. I never lost a burden for Sierra Leone. Uh, everybody I would talk to, I would tell them in South Africa, I'd tell them about Sierra Leone. And so it got to the point where I, I started praying. I said, Lord, if you don't want me to go to South Africa, would you, I'm sorry, to Sierra Leone, would you please remo remove my burden? Because it's very difficult being in two uh, having your heart someplace else while working somewhere. Not only did he not remove it from me, it actually intensified to where I was literally dreaming about the country and just couldn't get it out of my mind. So one day in 2016, I was in my office, and I'm on my computer, and I'm looking up news about Sierra Leone, and I'm looking at maps of Sierra Leone, and I'm just praying. And the map comes up, and a map I've seen many, many times, but we had always been focused on the interior of the island on the east side. And then all of a sudden, I look, and on this map, there's, I see this island that I just never noticed before. Actually, so I go to my wife, and I'm like, Kelly, you know there's an island off the coast of Sierra Leone? And she says, no, there's not. And I said, look, it's, neither one of us ever noticed. And it's not a small island either. It's 17, sorry, 17 miles by 37 miles. Pretty big island off the coast. So I started doing research, trying to find any evidence of any mission work at all being done on the island. Talked to all my friends in the country. Talked to everybody I knew. <clears throat> nobody had ever been there. Nobody knew how to get there. And nobody had ever heard of any ministry work being done on the island. 
So I went to my friend, Mike Nielsen, the, the evangelist we did the VBS programs with and that I went to the prison with, and I said, I said, Brother Mike, I said, I believe God wants me to go to Bont, Sierra Leone. I don't know how to get there. You want to come? And he said, yes. So I, I love crazy people. You know, just they make the world go round, right? It's just fantastic. So by God's grace, in <clears throat> January of 2017, <coughs> excuse me, we were able to show up. And I'm telling you, I honestly believe that like 90% of the Christian life is just showing up. You know, this pastor said that from here. If you don't show up today, you can't hear what the Lord's got for you. You can't be part of what God wants to do. You got to show up. But more than that, you got to show up for the Lord. You got to show up for him as an ambassador of Christ, whether it's your work, whether it's your home, whether it's your job, whether it's the grocery store. Show up, but show up for the Lord. So getting to Sierra Leone oftentimes feels kind of like I can't get there from here. Um, and no matter where you are, it's really challenging to get, especially to our island. So that first trip, we went from South Africa. We had 42 hours of flights, four different flights. You finally land in Sierra Leone, and you're still not even close. So from the airport, you take a 10-minute taxi ride, and then a 35-minute water taxi ride, which is really fun because it's usually at night in the pitch black because there's very little electricity in the country. And so you, it, it is an excitement, exciting experience. And then you finally get over to the Freetown Peninsula, you take another 10-minute taxi ride, and you finally get to the hotel where you get a night's sleep after two days of travel. Now, here's where I say, any word that I say, like hotel or car or boat, anything like whatever you just pictured was absolutely wrong. Okay, so it's not it's not the hotel like you would picture in any way at all. The boats are hand built boats. Um, they are actually built on our island. When I talk about them, they're built on our island. They're hand built. They have no tools whatsoever except for chainsaws. They cut the trees down, rip the boards, put it all together. No power tools at all. And um, there's a trough down the middle of the boat with a bucket in it. If you're the person sitting right there while you're under voyage, you actually are the guy that scoops the water out of the boat. Um, it's it's actually a lot of fun. But that's what I'm saying. You're getting the wrong picture if you think of a fiberglass boat okay so um so we get to the hotel that, that first night you get a good night's sleep hopefully in the hotel and the next day you get up early in the morning and depending on the time of year the weather takes you about eight to twelve hours to drive 150 miles which is not very far to get to where the road ends and i knew how to get that far so we get to this village called Yagoy, we get out of the car, we walk up to the river, and uh, we're, Mike and I were praying and saying, you know, Lord, would you please make a way for us to get to the island? And when I opened my eyes, there's a man standing next to me, his name is Mustafa, um, he's still a good friend of ours. He says, sir, can I help you? I said, well, we're trying to get to Bont, I don't know how to get there. He said, I've got a boat. In less than five minutes in the village, we had a boat and we were on the way. So we got to show up. What we found is a place completely, absolutely forgotten. During British colonial rule, our village was the British diplomatic capital of Sierra Leone. At one time, there were 30,000 European settlers in our village. Um, there's actually the remnants of seven church buildings in our village, uh, the kind of European style, smaller scale, but they used to have stained glass windows and bell towers and all of that. Church of England and Methodist and Lutheran and Catholic and, and uh, you name it, they were all there. But as far as we know, no gospel witness was ever there. And so when the British gave them independence in 1961, they pulled out, the government of Sierra Leone moved to Freetown, and these people were just completely forgotten. And so when we got there, these people, they, you could just see it, just walking around with like no hope, 85% unemployment in the village, no hope whatsoever, nothing to do. And people think, well, why don't they just move? Well, you, have, you don't understand tribalism. You can't just go move somewhere else. Because if you don't have your tribe or your friends or your family to go to, they won't let you stay. And they won't let you work. They won't let you live. So you are stuck where you are. They were stuck without hope. And then the gospel showed up. And so we got there the first day. We went walking through the village. Um, when you're in Africa, you can't just go to a village. You have to get permission to be there. And so our village is large enough. They have a mayor, but they have mayor, paramount chief, chief, and then a speaker. And that's the order of authority that comes down. So we were on the way to see the mayor. And as we were going, we were giving out tracts. Because, again, it's an English-speaking country. So we're giving out tracts. And with these three men walk uh, the other direction. We give them tracts. And they ask what these were. And I explained to them. And, and the, the one man looked at me and said, well, will you teach us? I said, absolutely. 
So we walked a little bit farther down to where these two paths meet, and there's this grass hut covered, stick, you know, pole built, just open air area where all these young men were just hanging around doing nothing. And so in a few minutes, we had 22 young men, most of them Muslim, come, and for two and a half hours, we preached the gospel. We answered every question they had. They had a lot of questions about the deity of Christ and, the, you know, was the Bible the word of God and was Christ crucified? And lots of great questions. So we answered all those questions. At the end of it, we gave an invitation. And 18 of those 22 young men publicly accepted Christ as Savior. Now, so what I want you to understand when I say publicly, we don't do the heads, uh, heads bowed, eyes closed the invitations. I'm not opposed to those. We just don't do them. Because in a Muslim culture, one of the most important things is that when someone gets saved, they immediately show the village, show their friends and family that they chose to become a Christian that day. So they publicly accepted Jesus Christ as Savior in front of everyone to start out. And it just went from there. So what I have is, uh, if you're familiar with the Jesus film, but it's a full-length movie that shows the life of Jesus Christ from the book of Luke. It's in something like 1,200 languages, um, so we can show it in any language that they choose us uh, choose to to um, to um, play the movie in. And so we have no electricity or any or any running water on the island. And so I have a backpack that has a battery-operated projector, battery-operated speakers, and a queen-size white bed sheet that we'll use as a screen. And so we've been still going around the villages. Well, the, the, that group of 18 young men that got saved that first day, I believe the first guy that I led to the Lord, but he was certainly one of the, fir the first. His name is Thomas Bappy. That young man, when he got saved, he got on fire for the Lord absolutely from the beginning. Actually, for three years, he worked with me. Every time I'd come through, every time I'd come through, never asked for a thing. Well, that first night, we're going to show the Jesus film, and we had 350 people come out to watch this film. And the bed sheet is, is, we use that because you can actually see the film from both sides. The problem was my little speakers weren't loud enough for people to be able to hear. And so I'm just like, oh, man, what are we going to do? I felt like a failure, like all these people want to come, and, you know, they're lost, they're going to hell, and I can't tell them, you know, have them show this film and preach. And, and so Thomas says, Pastor John, wait. And this man just got saved that day. He runs off and he's gone for like 20 minutes. And I'm like, you know, I'm an American. I'm like, the schedules, people are going to leave. Nobody laughed, nobody complained. They just sit there and wait. After 20 minutes, Thomas shows up with this giant battery-operated speaker he borrowed from someone and a 12-volt car battery, connects it all up so that we could play the film. And at the end, so what I do is I preach, usually for 20 minutes or so to, to set the film up. We show the film. Um, it was just really fun to do. The people, they've never seen any kind of entertainment at all. No films, no nothing. So it's really quite impactful for them. So when they see Satan uh, portrayed as a serpent on this big screen, they yell and scream, you know, because they hate snakes. And when they see them, the, the uh, disciples pulling in the nets full of fish, it's a, it's a fishing village. That's, that's how they live, is fishing still. And so they see that fish and they get really excited. So it's very impactful for them. And at the end of the film, we pause it. I don't love the invitation that the film gives, so I pause it there. And then I usually preach anywhere from another 30 minutes to an hour as the Lord leads. And then at the end of that, we give an invitation. So 350 people, 85% of the Muslim gathered around to watch this film. At the end, we give the invitation. And 192 people publicly accepted Jesus Christ as Savior absolutely just floored us. And so you understand, we are very, very careful not to exaggerate numbers. Um, it is something I don't believe honors God in any way at all. And so we only count the first hands that go up. Okay? And so there's a lot of hands that went up after the 192, and some of them may have gotten saved, but some of them copy. So we don't count that. So 192 people went like this, that they accepted Christ as Savior that day. And so it was just a phenomenal response. And then we did it again in another part of the village, in another part of the village, and everywhere we went, the Lord just gave us such grace, and we had so many people get saved. It was just absolutely phenomenal. So I go back to South Africa, just thanking God because, you know, I could see there's open door and the hunger for the Word of God. And we began taking two to three trips a year to Sierra Leone from South Africa. And then, thankfully, in um, 2020, March 15th, 2020,
we handed the church, Solid Rock Baptist Church, over to a South African national who I'd been discipling. Church voted unanimously, unanimously to take him on as pastor. And then shortly thereafter, right in the middle of the start of COVID, we actually made the full-time transition over to Sierra Leone, which is where we are now serving today. So uh, in 2019, after many trips back and forth, we planted Bonth Baptist Church, the first ever Baptist church in our corner of the 1040 window. It's a lot of fun being the first ever Baptist church. Um, I tell people there, it's kind of like wearing a jersey. They love soccer. Uh, and so that's like a, a soccer jersey. It identifies you with a team. And so I say Baptist is the team, the jersey we're wearing. And what it uh, identifies us with is the word of God. Baptist is Bible. That's what we teach them. So if you come to our churches there and you from the, the pulpit, you say Baptist is, the congregation responds back, Bible. Because really that's what separates us from everything else out there that calls itself church, no matter what it is. Bible is the only rule of faith and practice. So they ask us, Pastor John, how do we do this or why do we do that? And I'll say, let's look at what the Bible says. And it's, a, it's the best thing we have. Praise God for the word of God. So we planted Bonth Baptist Church. Uh, that man, Thomas Bappy, I mentioned, uh, probably the first young man I led to the Lord. He is now pastoring Bonth Baptist Church. Um, in fact, he was also the first marriage we had in the church. Um, a year after he got saved, my wife and I were there, uh, my whole family, but we were there in Bonth. And my wife had the opportunity to witness to a young Muslim woman named Hawanatu. And she got saved. She got on fire for the Lord, and then Thomas and Hawanatu ended up getting married. And so the first actual Bible wedding in, in, the, uh, in the, uh, our church. And then they had the first child born in our church a year and a half ago. So we just praise God for that. It's been fan just phenomenal. <clears throat> so we would go around. Now we continue to go around to different villages around us. We go by motorbike or walking into the interior of the island, or we go to uh, by boat. We go to different villages. There's over 150 villages within our scope of influence for our ministry. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we started going to more villages, and we planted a second church, uh, and we didn't even know it for a year and a half. So we went to a, vill a village called York. It's on another island about 45 minutes away from my village, Bonth. And we went there, and it's a, it's a village of 100% Muslims. There's about 350 people in the village. And what's fun with dealing with Muslims is we get there to show the film just as it's getting towards sundown, because we have to show the film in the dark. And so they have, they have to pray five times a day. They have to pray at sundown. So here they are all on their prayer mats facing Mecca, praying to a false god. And by the way, if anybody ever tells you that we have the same God, okay, we don't. We really don't. The God of the Bible has a son. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Allah has no son. It's a different man. So it's a different God. So they're preaching or they're praying to a false God. They roll up their prayer mats and then we come and tell them about Jesus Christ. So his village came and they, they watched the film the same way. I preached, showed the film, preached again, gave an invitation. And we had 112 of them publicly accept Christ as Savior. So what I have is I have a solar-powered audio Bible. And so we give them this as a, as a gift to the village um, when we have a group get saved. We give it to the, the group that got saved. And so that audio Bible has the entire Bible in English. It has the New Testament in uh, Creo, Mendy, and Sherbro. They don't have the whole Bible available in those languages. And then they have the plan of salvation in all four of those languages and the major Bible stories in all four of those languages. So it's a phenomenal tool that we get to give them when we go to a village until we can come back and do further discipleship and Bible training. So I give this, this to the village. And I remember this because we've done this many times, but most of the villages, honestly, the man who steps forward to, to take it uh, comes forward very pridefully. Like he's, yeah, I'm the guy, give me that. Right. And so, um, I mean, they just got saved. What do you expect? You know, so but the guy that came forward in, in York, I remember him because he didn't come forward like that. He was very hesitant. They almost to like they pushed him forward. Okay? And I remember that because of the humility that I saw in him. So he came and he thanked me, he took it. We go back to Bonth and then I go back to South Africa. And so uh, then a year and a half later, I'm back in Bonth. We're getting ready to, for the full time transition. And 
York sent someone from their village to find me. And they, they said, Pastor John, we're you know, thankful for coming. You're here again. We, I've been sent to ask you if you will come back to York a second time. And I said, well, I, I'm willing to go back, you know, for Bible training and discipleship, but evangelism, there's like 150 villages have never heard the gospel. And they were just really adamant. They pleaded with me, and I said, okay, I'll go back. So we went back. We showed up on the beach, and that man that I'd given the audio Bible to, he comes and meets me on the beach, and he introduces himself as pastor. And I was honestly, I was like, oh, boy, okay. I said, you know, he said, come and see my church. And I, I was like, I couldn't believe it. So I go, here's this 100% Muslim village. In the back of the village is a brand new little church building the size of a two-car garage with a cross on the front. I said, brother, you've got to tell me what, what happened. He said, well, after you left, he said, I started listening to the audio Bible, start listening to the stories, the Bible stories that were on them. And then people that got saved that night, they would come and they would ask me to tell them the stories that I'd been listening to. So we began meeting together and I'd share these stories with people and I would start listening to more and then telling them more of the stories and telling them what we saw in the film and that. And he said, they started calling me pastor and he said, we started, we had a church. And I said, well, well how did you get the building? He said, well, about four months after my first visit, a Dutch tourist came through. Now, you have to understand, we don't get tourists out there. Okay? We are really, really, really remote. Okay? We're in the middle of nowhere. But a Dutch tourist comes through on a Sunday during a church service, sits in the service. After the service was over, he says to the man, tell, tell me how this happened. So he explains how it happened. And he said, but you don't have a building. I said, no, because they were just meeting in an open air area. He said, well, I want, I want to build you a building. So this guy was there for four hours, gave them enough money to build this little church building, and here we had planted York Baptist Church for a year and a half, and we didn't even know it. So now that we know he's there, we've been giving him Bibles and training and everything we can to help grow his spiritual life so that he can lead better. So then in, uh, in, in a very long story that I won't get into tonight, because some of you will fall asleep, um, we came back for our first furlough. This is our first furlough in, in eight years. We came back from Sierra Leone to take our first furlough uh, in uh, actually July 16th, 2021. Um, and we thought, oh, eight, eight months, maybe a year, we'll be back on the field. Uh, fortunately, I ended up getting COVID um, in, on July 16th, 2021. And it was not just a normal, like I've had it twice before that. It ended up being very, very serious. I spent 97 days in the hospital in Johnson City, Tennessee, 63 days on a ventilator. I am a walking miracle. There's no question about it. My kidneys failed. My lungs collapsed. I had pneumonia in both lungs, blood clots in both lungs. Um, my wife and I just counted on Friday. Uh, she went through her notes 13 times. They told my family that I was going to die. Um, they flew my, my daughters from Bible college out to Tennessee to say goodbye to me. Um, they said I was brain dead, but God had a plan. He had a purpose. And so people all over the world prayed for a miracle, and I woke up. And although I woke up paralyzed on dialysis with nine different tubes in my body, um, after a year-long recovery, I am back to almost full health again. Got off dialysis after five months. That's a miracle in and of itself. My lung function is normal, um, which also is a huge miracle. Um, they said, even when they said, uh, okay, he's awake, but he won't be himself. His brain is gone. I still have a brain. I don't know how good it is, but I still have one. Um, and so that kind of interrupted um, the, the schedule a little bit in, in our eyes. Okay? But God had a plan. Um, a lot of people will say to me, they'll say, well, God's not done with you yet. Um, and, and that's absolutely true. Okay? I, I completely agree with that. But like I sh shared, you know, when I shared the date I got saved, the greatest miracle that I've ever experienced wasn't getting through COVID. It was in Portland, Oregon on December 22nd, 1995, the day I got saved. That is by far the greatest miracle that any of us could ever hope to experience in our lives. Because if you're saved from COVID or cancer or heart attack, and then you die a few later, years later and go to hell, that wasn't a very good miracle. But if you're born again, you don't have to be afraid to die. Therefore, you don't have to be afraid to live. But when I woke up in the hospital, laying there paralyzed on di dialysis and all these tubes and all of that, I thought God was done with me. And it was honestly the hardest day of my life because I love being a missionary. I love what we do. And the Lord brought many verses to my mind, but the verse that he brought to my mind that moment was, be still and know that I am God. 
And it's just that peace of God that passes all understanding. I'm not kidding. It just like overcame me. And it got me through that. My wife, she prayed with me every day for 97 days, even when I was gone unconscious. She read the Bible to me. She sang hymns with songs with me. Just kept the word of God there present in my life. Then when I got, finally got home, they, they wheeled me out of an ambulance in a hospital bed and moved me from there into a hospital bed that we had rented in, in a living room in a house we had rented. First time we've had a home in America in nine years. And I'm laying in that hospital bed, and I finally got enough strength to use my arms. And I go back through, and I, I start underlining the Bible verses that God used during that time of COVID. And I look, came to that verse, be still and know that I am God. Now, I don't know if you know the whole verse. That's actually only part of the verse. Um, I didn't actually know the whole verse. Um, God had used that verse many times in my life. But that verse says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. See, God wasn't done with me, but more than that, he had a plan for our suffering and for what we went through. So when I went back to Sierra Leone the first time, May of last year, to give them proof of life, at that point, I still could barely walk. I was actually in a wheelchair in the airports. They were wheeling me around to get me from flight to flight. And I went through all of those flights and through the car and the taxis and all of that. And I got on the boat. They had to carry me onto the boat, put me onto that boat, and bring me to, to Bont. And the whole way through from the airport, I know people. I mean, I know so many people in the country because reaching Muslims, it's so much about relationship. And every single Muslim I met all the way through, all the way to the island and through the three-day reunion where people would meet me just crying and crying. Every Muslim I met looked at me and said, God did a miracle in your life. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. Every single one of those Muslims would say that to me. And I would look at them and say, yes, my faith in Jesus Christ, the great physician, who's able to heal not just the body, but the soul from hell preserved my life so that I could come back here and tell you that Jesus loves you and he wants you to be saved. Every single one of them through. And then I get to the jetty. And on the jetty with a big group of people from our church and people who know me, there's this man standing off to the side, excited, crying. He's full Muslim attire from head to toe. And when I get up on the, the jetty, he comes and he wraps his arms around me, just bawling like a baby, and he's jumping up and down. He's the imam from the main mosque there in Bonth. And he said, Pastor John, we're so glad you're here. He said, we've been praying for you at the mosque that you would get better and come back. You see, he would be exalted among the heathen. He would be exalted in the earth. You see, God uses our suffering. God uses our pain. I said, if you will show up for the Lord, if you will be willing to be used of the Lord, God wants to do great things in the world. He just wants us to obey and surrender. And so from that time, uh, even though we now officially are on our first furlough, um, we're going to do 12 months of furlough. I've made multiple trips back to Sierra Leone. Uh, my wife and I are going again in October, November, and then we have two months left of furlough, and then we'll go over full time again in January. <clears throat> but when I was in Sierra Leone in January, we planted two more churches because of the impact that, that this COVID had on the people there uh, to a great extent. Um, both churches were very similar stories. I'm going to tell you one briefly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I had led these two different men to the Lord, um, one six years ago, one three years ago. They had been in our church and, and trained up as much as we could. And then they both got jobs as teachers in different villages. And so, I mean, 85% unemployment rate. Okay, these both men got jobs as teachers. That was of the Lord. And so they go to their villages, and they did what I told them to, which was share the gospel. And so they both called me and said, Pastor John, I'm in the school. There's people getting saved. There's people that they want me to start a church. Can you come help me start a church? And so I, I did this to both villages. But I, this one village I went, it was at four hours by boat to the very north end of our island. And we get out of the boat, and I walk up. They take me through the village to the speaker, the, the man, you know, uh, paramount chief, chief and speaker. He's the man under the, and, and, uh, in authority there. And this man is full Muslim, again, head to toe. It's a Friday afternoon, which is the Muslim holy day. And I walk up to him, expecting to do the big greetings back and forth, big, back, you know, back and forth, big speeches. Instead, he walks up to me, gives me a big hug. And while he hugs me, he says, I can't wait to get saved. I was like, wow, 
So then we go to the school where my, my guy Solomon has been, te been teaching, and he's got a, the room is full with about 25 uh, adults and children. And the, he says on behalf of the village, he says, uh, Pastor John, thank you for coming. We would like to be a church. We'd like to start a church. So Baptist is Bible, Bible right? So we look at the Bible, and it's those who gladly received the word were baptized and added unto them. That's our church planning formula from the word of God. And so we shared the gospel. I spent 45 minutes sharing the gospel with them, answering their questions, any questions they had. Um, and 10 of the adults publicly accepted Christ as Savior. Eight Muslims, one Methodist, one Catholic. Now, there was no Catholic or Muslim, Muslim, uh, Methodist churches in that area. You're either born Methodist or Catholic or Muslim. That's the way it works. And so I didn't ask them to, but those 10 people stood up and then stood in a little group together. Like they knew they were called out. Isn't that kind of cool idea? So they come and they stand there. And I said, let's talk about baptism. So for more than an hour, I taught baptism from the Bible. I especially used the, the Ethiopian eunuch, which is a fun, fantastic story of baptism and faith. And also it's an African. So they really connect with that and identify with the Ethiopian eunuch. And so I, after I teach that, um, answer all their questions, um, they, they turn around and they huddle together for a few minutes and talk. And they turn to me and the same guy says, Pastor John, we'd like you to, to baptize us. So I take them out right into the sea, right off the island, and we walk out one by one. I hear their salvation testimony, which was really impressive. I'm telling you, it was actually just literally blew me away. One after the other after the other. These 10 brand new believers baptized, baptized. And the people, they're, they're cheering and yelling on the beach. It was just, it was absolutely incredible. And Tom Bay Baptist Church was planted that day. And then two days later, we did it again in another village with the other man, Paul, who got a job as a teacher. It's a wide open door. Amen. Now, getting back to the word of God where he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I think you all believe that. I think that you, you here, you're a good Baptist church, right? You've got the Word of God. You've got preachers that are preaching the Word of God. Hopefully, you are here today and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Hopefully, you've called upon the name of the Lord and found salvation by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Just in faith in Jesus Christ, the finished work on the cross. But the thing is, is that all over the world, there are people who have never called on the name of the Lord. And the way that Paul writes it here, he says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? You see, we, we deal with almost exclusively Muslims in most of the villages. And last year, one of my friends that was with me, helping me take that first journey back, um, when, they, when people heard that I was back in the village, a village just across the water from us named Bendu, who's waiting anxiously, just passionately waiting for us to come back and plant a church there, okay, after doing, we did evangelism, they sent someone over to greet me and welcome me back and thank God on behalf of the village that I was alive and, and coming back. And one of my friends looked at him and he said, can I ask you, he said, um, you know, you were a Muslim before? And he said, yeah. He said, your village was a Muslim village? They said, yeah. So, well, if you're so open to Jesus Christ, why were you Muslim? And the response he gave still to this day convicts me, and I hope it convicts you as well. He said, they came first. Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave us the Great Commission, the commandment of God to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we can complain and lament about the spread of Islam. They're sending so many missionaries out. I had the opportunity to witness the six Pakistani imams sent from Pakistan to Sierra Leone specifically to spread Islam in my country. But I was there, and I got to preach Christ to them because I showed up. Not because I'm anything. I am nothing, but he is everything. Amen. And he, I am a bought with a price. I'm not my own. Amen. And how can they... Call on him whom they've not believed. You understand, all over the world, there are people desperately seeking. Muslims are some of the most spiritual people you'll ever meet in your life. They want to go to heaven, and they've been lied to. But they shall know the truth, and the truth can what? Make them free. But how can they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And what does it say? How can they hear without a preacher? Someone has to be willing to go. Somebody has to be willing to go. But here's the thing. Not just to Sierra Leone. 
Okay? Do you realize that each and every one of you here tonight, if you are saved, if you are born again Christian, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You are. It's not a choice. It's not like, oh, tonight I will be or won't be. Now, you can be a good ambassador or you can be a bad ambassador. But either way, you are representing Jesus Christ. People can look at you and say, you're a Christian? With a question mark. Or they can hear Christ, see Christ, and maybe desire Christ because of the way you live, because of the way you speak, the way you act. You understand? That's the, that's the purpose. But everywhere we go, all of you, every single one of you, I guarantee you, I'm going to ask a question. Don't raise your hand. Tell me. How many of you have unsaved family members? Think about it. Somebody just propped into your mind. You have unsaved neighbors. People that you've lived next door, sometimes for years, you see them very often, you wave as you go back and forth in and out. People at your work that are unsaved, if they died today, they would go to hell. Yeah. Maybe you worked with them for years. People in your schools, people in your sports, people at the grocery store, people at the restaurant you go to, people at the, the post office. Do you believe the gospel? Amen. That's good. How can they call in him in whom they've not heard. That's right. And how can they hear if someone doesn't preach? You see, we're in Sierra Leone, and I thank God for the churches around the United States that have faithfully supported us for the last 10 years. And we do need to raise more support. We went at 71% eight years ago. That's a little bit less now. But God is faithful. But the thing is, is you said missionaries, I love your missions wall, but you said missionaries over there, but what about here? See, if you will do the work that you're supposed to be doing here, the work of the church will grow, this church will grow, and then more missionaries can be sent out to go to the uttermost. Because time is desperately short. You understand, it is not time to get a bigger bank account, a bigger house, a nicer car, a new iPhone. Right now is the time to get busy with our Father's work. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Are your feet looking good? Or do you just bring the world with you where you go? See, you know, we're supposed to be walking and living and showing up that when they hear our footsteps, they're like, oh, praise God, help came. We went to a village, a village called Bahoy, and I won't tell you the whole story because of time. One of my favorite stories, though, we get to this village, 85 Muslims, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of darkness, surrounded by a bush area where their resident demon, whose name is Kasila, lives and has tormented them for generations. And we showed up with Christ. And when we met with the village, they all come out to do our greetings. And the chief, the witch doctor, and the imam met us to do these greetings. The chief looked at me and said this. He said, we are so thankful you're here. We've been praying for years that somebody would come and tell us about Jesus Christ. You see, they're waiting for somebody who's willing to go. Jesus said almost 2,000 years ago, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And then he gives us a prayer request. Don't you think it's kind of cool that Jesus asked us to pray for something? You know, uh, will you pray for me to find a job? Or will you pray for me to get you know, some money to pay my bills or a new car? Would you pray for my health? Would you pray for something? Jesus Christ asked us to pray for something. He said, because the laborers were few, he said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. In just our country alone right now, being as generous as possible with what we call a missionary, there is one missionary to every 1.2 million people in our country. And I've been to 26 countries, and every one of them, the laborers are few. And if I talk to your pastors, the sad fact is right here, Longview Bible Baptist Church, the laborers are few. It doesn't have to be that way. If you will just surrender to the Lord and say, here am I. There's a purpose to your life. I said to you, people say to me, God is not done with you yet. And he's not done with me yet. But let me tell you this, and this is what I'm going to close with for tonight. If you are here tonight and you are born again, if you are saved, you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you are not in heaven, you are still here. 
God is not done with you yet either. There's something that God wants you to do. And it's not something I can do, your pastor can do, or anyone else can do. You, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. There's something that God wants you to do, or he would take you home. We've got to be faithful, and we've got to be willing to say, for to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Every one of us lives for something. I think we need to start living for Christ. Let's bow your heads and pray. Father God, I thank you and praise you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for the gift of your word. I thank you for that unspeakable gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to share and to preach a little bit to this group of your people, Lord, your believers, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, I ask you, please, Lord God, to send forth laborers into your harvest here in Longview, in Kelso, in Washington State, in the west coast of the United States, and all over the world, Father God, in Mexico, in Canada, and all over, everywhere, Father, but the uttermost. Father, where it is hard to live, it is hard to be, it is hard to, to just be comfortable. But Father, where souls are dying and going to hell, and they desperately need to hear the gospel. Please, Father, send forth laborers into your harvest. I uh, thank you and I praise you. And as your pastor takes over, please keep your eyes closed. Thank you. Thank you, Brother John. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet tonight. And as we begin our invitation, I'm going to read that verse that Brother John mentioned in Matthew 9, a few verses. Verse 36, it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as a sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Tonight we agreed earlier that we, we came to hear something. We came to hear from God. And we came and we heard a man that had a successful construction business, successful home inspecting business, and said, the laborers are few. I need to take a step. Tonight we're going to sing, take my life and let it be. I hope that's our response to God's word tonight. Say, Lord, whatever it is, I'll surrender because I know the laborers are few. I'm a Christian. I've been bought with a price. I'll take that step. Lord, take my life. If the Lord Holy Spirit spoke in your heart, as we sing, you come as we sing. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord. People need labors, amen. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. And let's sing that next verse. Lord, take my life. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful. Yes. Take my voice and let me see always, only for my King. Always. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a minute as the pianist continues to play. People doing business with God in the auditorium. How about you? Have you seen when you go into a store that people are miserable? Have you seen when you smile, people don't smile back, they're dead in their eyes? Have you seen a coworker just be miserable? They just punched the clock for 20, 30 years. Nothing to live for. Countries around our world. People dying and going to hell. We have the answer. Lord, take my life. Lord, I'm yours. I'll surrender. Always only for my king.
Amen. Hey, Brother John, thank you so much for being with us tonight and powerful challenge from the Word of God. Amen. And isn't it awesome to hear that God doesn't just save people in Longview or in Kelso or in the United States. God works and the gospel works around the world. How powerful. What he wants is some labor, some volunteers, some recruits that will say, I'm going to go do that. I'm going to preach. I'm going to teach the word of God. And if he's knocking on your heart's door tonight, we have had an emphasis on the mission. The mission. It is the mission to spread the gospel. That's what we're here for. We have some fun times and we have some, uh, some picnics and we have some good times that we get to spend with each other. But the purpose of the church is the mission. So if God's knocking on your heart and saying, I want you to maybe up your, your missions giving a little bit, listen to that. If he says, I want you to be involved in that next missions trip, listen to that. If he's saying, I want you to give up your business and go across the big pond and spread the gospel, listen to that. Whatever it is, he's a good God. He loves us and he'll take care of us, but we have to listen and submit and allow him to take our life and let it be. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for coming to our, our Wednesday night service. Uh, Brother John, I'm going to ask you and your wife, you go ahead and go out to the back so that we can uh, visit you guys at the table as we pass by out there. And uh, we want to thank you guys for coming. And uh, good night in God's house. Let's go ahead and be dismissed in prayer. But whatever we do, don't allow for the devil to take away the seed that was sown. Keep it in front of our eyes and our hearts so that the mission can be what we're all about. Amen. Brother Brandon, would you close us in prayer tonight? Sure. Lord, we just thank you for the message you've given us tonight. Lord, we just, uh, Lord, hearts are stirred. I just pray about that. Lord, we would uh, go into this world, Lord, behind us <laughs> spreading the gospel, Lord. Uh, Lord, it feels like so often we just kind of go out in our lives and forget about what we're really here to do. Lord, it's... Uh, the grind is real, but the grind for your people is even more real. I just pray, Lord, that we would take that to heart, Lord, that uh, Lord, we would uh, Lord, just uh, be giving more to missions, Lord, be part of the influence. I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, have us get home safely tonight and back to church on Sunday. Amen. Amen.